welcome to Catechris Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.catechris.com. My name is Jason J. Rock Houston, and today we're speaking with uh, Lockjaw guitarist uh, Jeff Ogle. How are you doing today, Jeff? Hey, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Doing yeah. great. Yeah, you know, um, i got to be honest, Jeff. Um, until your publicist um, sent me the little press release on the band's new single, I've never heard of you guys, but um, given, the, um, given the single and the video a listen and watching it, um, really impressed with what I heard. I mean, that's how good this song is. The, the current single, of course, is for the song Living In My Head, and there's a video to go with that. Um, I listened to that, and right away, um, I kind of thought it's it's like got a little bit of a Pantera influence to it, maybe with a little bit of melody, if you know what I mean, but just over the top, pure, um, full-blown on metal. Oh, man, thank you so much. We That song, you know, means a lot to us just because not only what we're talking about the, the the subject of where we are in the world today and all the anxiety and stress that people are going through but just that riff if you're going back to just the actual music itself that riff came out of nowhere it was just a a little thing i was doing one day and it sounded cool and my singer was sitting here tracking i think we were tracking the first song off the album they said man that riff right there we've got to do something with that riff and so I was like, okay, I didn't think anything of it. So I played with it and demoed it a few ways. And he was like, oh, man. And then my producer heard it. And he was just like, Let's, we've got to do something with that riff. I was yeah, like, okay. I, I got to tell you, uh, it's funny you mentioned the riff because I guess the riff a lot of times um, in any, any song is where it all starts. But um, uh, I don't want people to think it sounds anything like it. But kind of reminds me of the riff of um, like Inner Sandman in the sense, not that it sounds like it, but like, like I've heard James Hetfield say, you know that that is a riff or that is a song that he gets tired of playing but that's also yeah. the most famous metallica riff you know um you hear yeah. you hear that riff and you immediately you know what the song is <laughs> that's you know i talk about that a lot in my songwriting and but by the way james setfield is the reason i picked up the guitar uh 30 years ago i i, I worship those guys i just i, I I've actually met them too, and they're yeah. just as they're just as real and kind as they can be to their fans. But anyway, going back to it, I have a, a philosophy in songwriting, and I call it the the the, the uh, title riff or the hook riff. Yeah, yeah. And I use I use Inner Sandman a lot because every single person in the world knows the Inner Sandman riff. They know what that riff sounds like, and it immediately hooks them into the song. And it's a hook. You can call it whatever you want, but for me. That's where the song starts. If I don't have some kind of hook riff or some title main riff that grabs people, I feel like I'm failing. You know, there's a lot of music out these days in the genre that are more percussive and groove based. It's just about the the, the chug, the top string chug that's going along with the kicks. And I'm not knocking that because we do that too. Yeah. But I just I want something that's a riff that's you're gonna remember it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, another another famous riff along those lines. Um. I, I'm told that um, most guitar players um, want to learn like top two riffs to learn. It probably um, "Smoke on the Water," of course, by Deep Purple, and um, "Stairway to Heaven." And um, and, and it's funny because I've heard Richie Blackmore like um, talking in an interview over uh, you know recently talking about everybody you know loves that "Smoke on the Water." If everybody says what a great song that is, he says it's a good song. It's not his favorite song, but but it doesn't matter what he thinks; it's what everybody else thinks. You know. <laughs> You know, there's no mistaking good. Good is good, and yeah. that's why that's why only one percent of the million bands that are out there make it and commercially. Because um, I have a guy uh, that was consulting for me. Uh, he's pretty well known in the industry. Uh, he, uh, I think, he was a part owner of Seek and Strike, okay. but he was consulting for me in a different situation, a different capacity when we released the first single. And he told me straight up. He said uh, his name is Randy, really nice guy. He did a lot. He really helped us out a lot, and gave us kind of got us on the right track when we started getting ready to release this new music with our producer Chris. And anyway, long story short, he says, <clears throat> "Hey, look." There's a lot of bands out there that have had rich dads or a lot of money that will put themselves out there and will have that backing. And he said, and they fail. He yeah. said, if the music is not there, no matter how much money you put behind it or how much marketing, the music's going to fail. He said, you can't trick the crowd. You can't trick the population of metalheads or the music lovers out there. If it's good, it's good. And there's no mistaking that. It doesn't matter how much money you put behind it. And I, I thought, man, you know what? That is a really... 
uh, profound statement because I've always had that. You know, yeah. If you listen, if you listen to terrestrial radio, commercial radio, you hear the bands that they wear out. I won't name any bands. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you, you know, the bands that they've worn out on top forty rock radio, and it's just you're like, oh my god, I never want to hear this song again. You know, and, yeah. That's what I, I love. Always thought they bought on, you know, but no, yeah. it's not. It's just because those songs are catchy and they know they can make money on them. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I love about going on YouTube or even the internet. I mean, there are so many great out bands out there that people do not really even know about. But you know, you, you yeah. I, I know myself in looking for bands to interview, and that I discover so many great bands just on the internet alone. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, no, I. I I really, since we started getting ready to release this album, I've really started opening myself up to even more music. Because I'm, I mean, dude, I'm old school, man. I love Metallica and Pantera and, you know, yeah. Kill Switch Engage and Lamb of God. I'm Slayer. You know, I'm, that's my, my, my world that I lived in in the 80s and the 90s, you know. And now I'm really trying to open myself to what's actually going on the scene. And what I like about what we're doing is just a little, it still has the same, we're, our goal is to write catchy music. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're writing in the heavy metal genre. We're writing in the heavy metal core, or whatever you want to call it yeah. these days. But as long as it's catchy and it's good, it doesn't really matter where that really falls to me. As long as it has some hook riffs, some hook vocals, that people are going to remember it and they're going to like it and they want to see it. You know, that's that's all I really care. It doesn't really matter where we fall. But I've, I've been noticing a lot of the bands out these days are just really, they're kind of following a formula. And it's kind of it's kind of a little different than my school. So I'm glad that we're a little bit different. I'm glad that we kind of still have some of those vibes of, of a few years ago, you know? Yeah, you're, 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 one of, like, you're what I'd consider a new, new, new breed of metal. I mean, like I said, I'm watching the video for, um, you know, this song... Um, uh, uh, living in my head I mean uh, definitely I hear Pantera influence but I don't want people to think that you guys are like any kind of um, Pantera clone band it's just your influence coming out but um, sure. that's what you know great musicians kind of do they they kind of um, create their own music based on what they uh, grew up on and I was kind of interested you were mentioning what a huge influence James Hetfield was on you uh, talk a little bit about that, because, I mean, a lot of people, you know, you bring up Metallica, immediately they think of Kirk Hammett. I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, James, Kirk Hammett's great and everything, but James Hetfield, for being a rhythm guitar player, he, he's he got something special, you know, kind of like Malcolm Young of ACDC. Kind of. He, he, man, what can I say? Um, I think I look at, I mean, I honestly look at him as a role model in many ways, because, you know, if you look at him in his journey and as the music career, I mean, you got to imagine these guys became uber famous very early in their, in their 20s, and they've been famous their whole entire adult life. And so not only did he suffer or did he go through the addiction thing, the alcohol thing, and he went to rehab a couple times, but he's, he's made sacrifices for his family and for his, his kids. And I just have a lot of respect for the dude, uh, other than just how amazing he is at music. And I mean, that right hand, we know whenever he dies, they need to cut his arm off and put it in the Smithsonian, you know, because that, that, that right hand created so many, I mean, if you listen to any of the podcasts and all the other uh, rock guitarists, they all say Hetfield. Hetfield yeah, yeah, Hetfield. you know. He's the guy that taught him that right hand. I mean, everybody watched him do it. And, you, you, know? Know, you know, just talking to you, what, what kind of popped in my head as we're talking about him is, um, you know, I remember a number of years ago when they were doing the tour with Guns N' Roses and they had to yeah. stop the show because his, his arm got burned and was kept, you know, <laughs> and all that. So just think, even after getting burnt like that on stage, he's still able to do what he oh, does. Yeah. You know, I mean, he really He's took one for he really took one for rock and roll. Now, um, are you guys signed a label, or you release um, your stuff independently? Well, we're independent right that's, now, that's good. and we're work we're working very hard to. You know, the industry's changed a lot, and labels are different, and the deals that are out there are yeah. different. It's not it's not like twenty thirty years ago. Whenever you are. Um, the labels got hit so hard with the music, the streaming industry coming on, you know, after Napster and then, and then coming into Spotify and they, the, the money isn't there and album sells the way it was. So a record deal, you know, obviously looks so much different for the artist. And so 
I've questioned a lot in my journey, what is the reason to have a label other than extensive relationships, marketing, um, label services and such. But, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of those things myself and I'm self-funding everything. So Yeah, and it's you know, kind of if, a, a double-edged thorn in the sense that, um, yeah, know. you know, but, but like I think what benefits a band like you guys is... Um, if you have even a little bit of success, you're able to put it all back into the band as opposed to, yeah. you know, yeah. the label getting more money than what the band's getting. I mean, yeah. and a lot of the bands I grew up on, I mean, um, uh, one comes to mind, Quiet Right. I mean, they they had, yeah. you know, they sold a lot of albums, but they had a lousy record deal. And, um, yeah. you know, so um, you hear all these stories, even a guy like um, John Fogarty, legendary classic rock singer, I mean, for, for, for many, many years... His um, record company like owned all the rights to his songs and stuff. He had to go to court and get all the rights back, but finally did. But you know, so a lot of times, if you release stuff independently, it goes back into the band. Yeah. And then also, like you're saying, who's going to market your stuff better than you? Yeah, it's just a, it's a money thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, when we released the original single, "Silence the Fear," we released that back in August. It was the first single off of this batch. Um, and I didn't, you know, I was thinking we're going to release a full length album at the time. But what I was realizing was that the industry changed so much that I need to be doing it every eight weeks and putting a single out and then a video and then a single and then a video and just keep that constant promotion going on to, to please these algorithms that run all of our lives now. You know, Spotify and Facebook and YouTube, you know, they're, they're the gatekeepers now. The record labels are not the gatekeepers. And so I realized pretty quickly that it was going to be kind of a money game. It's going to be, okay, I've got a single. Does this single, I'm going to put it out there in a small way and see if it gets response. If it gets response, then I'm going to put more money behind it. And I'm going to go, I'm going to spread the marketing. Okay, now I'm not just going to cover Texas. I'm going to cover the United States. And if the United States does well, I'm going to cover, you know, Europe, Brazil, Mexico, you know, those areas too because they're huge over there too so i'm just i'm just trying to figure out exactly how to do it but i, I just realized early on that it's a money game so how sure. much money does it make sense to put into it and if i get to that point and a label looks at it and says well these guys are self-funded and they've put in x amount of dollars and the song does well well maybe we want to take up but maybe the offer will look different maybe they'll say hey look we, all, we see how much money you put into this. We want to strategically partner with you guys and help you guys get on those tours and festivals and have some of that network that we have, have access to some of that network maybe because we've already put a lot of work in. So, you know, we're, we're, not, we're open to anything yeah. as long as it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I think you're doing it the smart way because um, also, um, besides a financial thing, um, if you got the backing of a label, you know, but also you got, you got the part of it... Um, Oh, you know, I don't hear of a hit single. You need you need to go write something more radio friendly or whatever. Um, and where is if you do it your way, you kind of um, I think it's more organic. You know, you you kind of know yeah. what, what what is right for your band as opposed to some guy telling you, no, um, we need something. You know, we need a harder edge. You know, back in fact, in fact, when I was growing up, they did have a formula. Of, um, like uh, you put out like a hard rock or a metal album, first thing would be like a heavy hitting tune or. Or hard rock and tune, and then it'd follow that up like with a power ballad or something. I mean, they really <laughs> had their formula back in the day, you know. Right, and, and that I mean, I think there is the three and a half minute banger that the vocals start within thirty seconds, and the the, the song is predominantly uh, uh, singing, melodic singing versus heavy screaming. I think there is a formula still that makes it to terrestrial or commercial radio. But, you know, I also think the world has changed so much and we have Octane, we have Liquid Metal, we have the internet, YouTube, people are becoming stars on YouTube and TikTok. So I think that there is an opportunity now to actually stay true to your original idea and vision. But that being said, we brought, we've been a band for 20 years. Oh, wow. Over see, 20. I had no idea. Yeah. Wow, so, so we started in 1998, in tech, and we're in Dallas, Texas. And how many how many albums do you guys released to date? Uh, that's kind of weird. Okay, so the first album we released an EP in 2001. Okay. And that was with the original vocalist. I started the band. Um, 
but with the original vocalist. And he was with us for about half the time. Then we took off a few years um, and got a second vocalist. And so then we put out two with him. And these we did all EPs because back then uh, there was really no point in doing a full length unless you're signed to the label. So we did all EPs and, so, and a bunch of singles. So the question there is, um, uh, can people still get this stuff if they want to check out what the band did before? Or are you starting? The old stuff. Are you starting off the, kind of fresh? Yeah, we're kind of starting fresh. And here, and that was at the advice of of uh, a few uh, labels that mm-hmm. we've currently been uh talking to and have been help consulting for us and helping us out but we got with a what, what has changed is we got with a producer his name is chris collier okay he's work he's currently working with bands like corn he just in fact those two new singles that corn just released were chris chris produced those oh wow and yeah and he is our producer and he is an incredible musician he's an incredible producer I mean, he's done stuff with Make Mars. He's done stuff with Prong, KMX, George Lynch. I mean, he's just a bunch of different bands. Well, I mean, definitely, he's, he's somebody so, to yeah get involved with. Yeah, we're working with Chris, and we have. I mean, we're we're doing our best to take the music to the absolute furthest it can go, to the best absolute final product we can get, and so it it really was over going to overshadow. Not that the other stuff was bad. It was yeah. all really cool stuff, and we have always have always had a good following here in Texas and done well. But we just really wanted to take it to the next level. So, at their advice, we pulled some of the old stuff down. We we will probably in the future re-release those, re- remix, remaster, re-release some of that stuff. But yeah. right now, we're just focusing on all everything, all the new stuff. That, that makes sense. But you see, part of the reason I asked asked about that is because you think about wow, a band that's been around. 20 years got to have uh, quite a set list you know and, and then of course if you have fans that have been following you since day one you know go back 20 years ago um i imagine that some of the people love the stuff from before you know just as much as the new stuff you know they do they do and we still play a few of those older songs uh we have just this new vocalist he was in the band his name is joe ortiz wow. he was in the band uh, jackknife oh wow uh, jackknife was they, they played with a bunch of nationals that you know their names like big bands and they did really well they were actually working with uh don bag and vinnie's uh manager when uh in damage plan when uh when everything went south for them oh, wow. uh, paul bassman was uh their manager so anyway long story short joe jackknife he's he's the new vocalist and so we're really just trying to rally around him and Makes take the sense. creativity to the next level and focus on that stuff. Uh, again, we, he does perform a few of the older songs live, and uh-huh. we're going to continue that because there's some band favorites. But we pulled them down right now because just the older recordings weren't where we wanted them to be to our standard where we are today. So we're, we're going to revisit those for sure. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So um, <laughs> let me ask. I would love to ask about the band's name. You're like, what's the story? How you came up with that? I love the fact it's kind of a one word, simple thing, lockjaw, kind of. Yeah. Got that metal sound. Uh, funny it. thing, so that happened in 1998. Um, we were, me and my best friend that started the band with me, we were driving from, uh, in Dallas, we were driving right through Dealey Plaza, right in the area where JFK was shot. Wow. And uh, driving to Deep Ellum, to the big, that's where the music scene in Texas is, is Deep Ellum in Dallas. And there was like, at that, at that time, there was just a bunch of really amazing clubs that, you know, some of them are still there, actually, Trees and, um, but anyway, we're going down to the local show on a Sunday night. They had a local show put on by the Eagle, and uh, which is our radio station here. And um, we were going down there and joking around about uh, all the girls that we might encounter. Okay. You know, and all, the, all the sexy females of Dallas, you know, joking around. And he was like, he goes, I better be careful. I'm going to come home with uh, some kind of disease. Like, And he said, he, and the funny thing was, he said, clubfoot, lockjaw, and these, you know, five, four or five other hilarious fake yeah, yeah, diseases. Yeah. He said Lockjaw, and I said, that's a pretty good name for the band right there, because we had just been talking about the name of the band. So being from Dallas, you can imagine, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Dr- at that time, Drowning Pool was coming up. Wow. Uh, Pantera was huge from Dallas. Yeah. I mean, we had a bunch of really amazing, other, and other bands that, you know, that were 
were just absolutely amazing here. So, you know, we're thinking about our band name, and it might have been closer to 2000, actually. It may have not been yeah. 98. Yeah, but it might have been closer to 2000. But anyway, long story short, it was just a funny fluke. Yeah, that yeah. Happened. It kind of it kind of fits. Got a metal kind of bent to the to the name. I I, I just love it. And um, talk about again the, the current single um, "Living in My Head." I, I mean, I just I just love it. You know. Um, Thank you. Yeah, but any anything specifically that it was written about? You talk about the guitar riff, but um, like anything that you were inspired about? Well, Joe, you know when Joe came in, he was as a as a vocalist. Joe with Jackknife was all heavy vocals he, he he had that same vibe of you know jesse leach from kill switch but without the melodic he, he was just all heavy and that's what jackknife was and jackknife became in their own right they were a really cool band i mean they were they accomplished a lot at back in the day and probably um a lot more than any other local band they did i mean there was us Lockjaw, uh, there was Element 80, they got big, there was Jackknife, but we never got as big as Jackknife, so they were really on to something, so when I ran into Joe at a Machine Head show right before the pandemic, Oh wow! <laughs> the last tour the Machine Head did, and uh, what, you know, we talked, and then at about that time we decided we were going to part ways, we had a couple opportunities to tour and stuff, and we, uh, we parted ways with our singer Corey, and and Joe came in, and so Joe, whenever he came in, he was really trying to find himself. He came in here and was doing heavy vocals in our studio, and, and he started saying, "Let's do." I said, "Well, let's try some melodic." And he said, "I've always wanted to do melodic. I've just never really had the opportunity to do it." Wow. And man, the first song he did melodic was "Silence the Fear," and it was just unbelievable. So I was, I was just his performance and how. You know, we've had a lot of problems with singers over the years, just trying to make sure that we were, you know, if we if we were going to sing melodic, uh -huh. making sure if you sing melodic, you really put yourself out there. It has to be done well. Yeah, I mean, it, like at the top hard. at the top of interview, that's how he described the song. When I was telling you, to me, it sounded like um, Pantera with uh, melody, which kind of sounds uh, yeah. weird, weird to say, but it, um, I think people will get it when they hear the song. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so there's melody to it. So Joe. That just came very natural to him. So with finding himself in that and just, you know, he is a very, um, yeah, you just have to talk to him. Yeah. You guys will have to interview sometime. But yeah, that sounds he good. Is, he is just a really cool guy and he's a great human being. I think that he just has a lot of really, like he's really in touch with the world today. Like he really feels the, the pressure and the anxiety and the stress that people are going through in this pandemic. We have a lot of friends that have lost their lives, their jobs, their health. I mean, all mm -hmm. kinds of things. The world was in turmoil in 2020. And I mean, on, quite honestly, it's still, it still kind of is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so how has that all affected? That's what we wrote about. We write about stuff like that, like anxiety, stress, you know, breaking through fear and things like that. Now, how, how did COVID and all the lockdowns and stuff affect you guys? I mean, did it affect you getting out and being able to pl play for a while? Or did you start concentrating on recording more music during that time? We focus on music. We weren't. I wasn't even in a place to play a show uh, yeah, yeah. during nineteen or twenty. We were. We were just deciding we were going to do a new album, and so I, I focus. I just. I just hunkered down. I more, wrote. Yeah. I wrote probably about sixteen or so songs during that period of time. More, more power to you, you know, um, Jeff. Because I mean, I've talked to some bands who their philosophy is we're not going to put anything new out there not going to do any live shows until all this is over but who, who the hell knows when that might be and then you got other guys like yourself you know what i'm just going to continue to work on the music and when it's time yeah. to release it we'll put out i know one guy's like in three different bands and he tell, tells me i got like my next five albums already in the can i mean how yeah. cool is that you know <laughs> well and, i mean i do shows too so i mean we're we're, we're playing show in texas the scene is not shut down and there's plenty of people hungry for our brand of music and this type of music so we just put on a huge show new year's eve wow and in texas and, uh, um it's a lot more free we there we had about 10 bands on it and yeah. it was yeah you know, there's probably eight or nine hundred people there it was a good show you and, know and so, in, so in texas we're, we're definitely trying to and we're picking up some more shows in austin and across texas because right now for us it makes sense to hit everything in the region but it doesn't really make sense to get out there and just go everywhere yeah. because each different state has different COVID rules and that's I'm just not going to go I mean we're yeah. in Texas which is 
they make it's very relaxed here. Uh, yeah, oh, we, cool. We're not seeing any surges of COVID yeah, yeah. or anything like that. We don't have to wear masks and, and businesses or anything like that. And we're not seeing any kind of surge. In fact, our COVID numbers are probably lower than a lot of the other states that are still requiring masks. Yeah, it's but, funny. So it's, it's funny. We're not like, really yeah. going all over the country right now. It doesn't make a whole lot of yeah. sense anyway. So It's funny, like you say, we're, we're the, the places like where I'm from, California, where they're really restrictive on, on things and you can't even go like to a concert or something unless you prove you're vaccinated and all that. Um, yeah. They they got you know talking about the spread. They got a lot more cases than in places like Texas and Florida. I don't know why that is, but it's just uh, kind of that's the trend, you know. It's suspicious. It, it sure is highly suspicious because yeah, yeah. You have different different governors and different leaders making different rules for everybody, and I've heard a lot of things about California. I would I I can't speak to those but I, i've heard that, that things are much more locked down there and it makes me think well without the mask maybe people are getting immune get some herd immunity or well, something. well, well just to give Hopefully. you an idea yeah just to give you an idea for two weeks like going back i think to june 15th that's when they first started letting people not have require people to wear a mask but it only lasted for two weeks you know hey buddy your your, your phone is cutting out i'm having a hard time hearing you oh can you hear me now yeah, yeah, it just sounded like the phone was getting. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was saying, um, in California for about two weeks, you know, in June, um, they let us go around without wearing a mask, but it only lasted for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, I, before we wrap it up, uh, Jeff, I was going to ask you. Um, so right now, like, do you have a target release date for the full length album, or are you still working towards that? Yeah, I'm having a real hard time. Okay. Here. I'm so sorry. Okay, let me let me try one more time and then we'll wrap it up. I was wondering in, in regards to the new album, do you have a target release date or uh, you know that's a good that's a good that's a good question. So we are working with our producer and going through each song and here's the thing. Releasing the whole album yeah. almost doesn't make sense anymore because of the way Spotify works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The algorithms work. So we're just literally going to put together 10 songs about every eight weeks we've already released the first three you've got silence of fear living in my head and we actually have a new single that just came out called devil in disguise and that's up that's on all streaming platforms oh, okay yeah so that's out now and we're getting ready to do the video for that so we're just going to keep on releasing the singles and when they're all together and they're done we're going to wrap it up put it in a bow on top and make it an album and that album will be there and we're just going to keep riding that way i don't know if we're going to make I think we're just going to continually, I have enough music to write probably this album plus half of the next one. So we're just going to continually just keep releasing songs. And it really is a good pace for our producer too, because he has other big projects going on. So it really helps us kind of stay an even pace. And honestly, our numbers have come up dramatically going at this pace. If we dropped it all at once, then we wouldn't have anything to promote after a certain period of time. So it's nice because you constantly have something new to, uh, put out there and it keeps everybody kind of ready for the next one you know oh cool yeah uh, uh so uh, jeff let me ask you before we um uh wrap it up for a day um sure. can you let people know where they can find find you in the band um online yeah you can go to lockjawlive.com that's one way that's it's easy that has all of our links social media and all that uh or on uh, instagram we're lockjaw metal uh-huh on Facebook, we're Lockjaw Live. Uh, and then uh, all of our links, if you go to any, our Instagram page or our Facebook page or anywhere, it has our uh, link tree, you know, all in one links, and it's got all of our social media, our streaming, uh, Spotify, all that stuff. Oh, that's so, cool, yeah. that's cool. So um, so thank, thanks, Jeff, for taking time to um, yeah. talk to me. I really appreciate it. And um, I was just curious, so have you guys been, toured much outside, not not in the immediate future, but in the past, have you toured much outside of uh, Texas? We've hit, we, uh, our friends LM80 took us um, out on tour. It was probably around 05, 06, before our, we took a hiatus between about 09 and 2015. We took about a six, seven-year hiatus just family reason stuff but we we took we went to the east coast we went to uh louisiana mississippi florida georgia carolinas we, we kind of went that way but we've never gone west oh cool we've, oklahoma we've been, we're, we're hoping to start reaching out west because i want to get to california that would be cool yeah everything opens up 
Yeah. Uh, are you in L.A.? Where are you at? Well, I'm, I'm in Long Beach, but not too far. It's about 45 minutes away from L.A. Yeah. What are the good places? What are the is, is San Francisco still a hot spot for thrash metal and stuff like that, or is that still a thing there? Um, not not as big as it once was, but yeah, it, there's still a there's still a market for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. when we get ready to come out there, I'll definitely reach out to you. Yeah, and like I said, Jeff, thanks for doing the interview. And you know, I just think it's so cool that um, you, you hooked up with your new singer um at, at, at a at a, 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 a you know a, another uh, metal concert. <laughs> Machine Head. Cool. Machine Hanging Head. Hanging out with uh, Machine Head, watching them, and we did the meet and greet, got to hang out with the Machine Head dudes when they did that uh, reunion Burn My Eyes tour. So I got to I got to talk with Logan, you know, their old guitar player. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, of course, Rob Flynn and all the Machine Head dudes. They're, that's one of my favorite bands also. Talking about somebody that's very similar to Hetfield, though, you know, the guys that play and sing and has that heavy right hand, Rob Flynn is one of my uh, favorites, so, yeah, yeah, it was cool to be yeah, yeah, Rob Flynn, very underrated player, but, um, thanks again for doing the, um, yeah. interview, we'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch, and, uh, yeah. when I get a chance later, I'll send you all my, um, contact info, and I'll hit you up on the Facebook, like I said, the interview will be going up in probably about a week or two, um, once sure. I have a concrete date, I will, uh, let you know, take care, my friend. Hey, well, thank you so much. Anytime, bye-bye. Chaotic Drift Magazine.